seminar I hear is strictly about pneumatic conveying and, and troubleshooting pneumatic conveying problems. Um, broken into two parts, um, there's dilute phase equipment, dense phase equipment. I'm separating them uh, as we talk through so that uh, I'll just do dilute phase at first, and then we'll talk about dense phase troubleshooting uh, after that. This first part, dilute phase. Um, I put this presentation together in the spirit of, uh, I had a, one of my children call me up one day at work and say, Dad, I was mowing the yard and the mower died and I can't get it started again. What do I do? And uh, I simply said, well, it's very simple. A gasoline engine needs gas, air, and a spark. It's not getting one of those three things. So figure out what that is and you can get going again. And sure enough, we called up a little bit later and said, Dad, gotta go, and ran out of gas. So, <laughs> pneumatic conveying systems are, are kind of the same thing. Um, when they work, they work great. They work in the background and you never even know they're there and that's what they look like when they're working great. Um, however, sometimes they look like this. <laughs> and we've all had that, um, or we've got people standing around trying to figure out what in the world is going on. Um, pneumatic conveying systems have four pieces of equipment, just like the lawnmower needs three. Um, pneumatic conveying systems need four pieces for the work right. Uh, the first piece is a blower package. Whether it's vacuum or pressure, it needs a blower package. And the blower provides a volume of air needed for the system and a pressure. And pressure is either pressure positive or pressure negative to work right. Uh, it needs a convey line to get from point A to point B. It needs a filter or bin vent at the end, a third piece, uh, which separates the material from the air. And it needs a rotary valve, or in this case, it's a rotary airlock. And rotary airlocks, um, I, I love this picture right here. A revolving door in a building is a rotary airlock, and it does exactly the same thing as a machine cast rotary airlock in a dilute uh, pneumatic conveying system does. It lets people through or let stuff through while maintaining a pressure differential. Um, every hotel probably here in town that you go through, you either go through a revolving door or you go through a double doors or a double dump valve to get into the building. So but anyway, you got those four pieces of parts that are in every system. And so when you break it down, when you have problems and you start looking at how do I go find out what's going on, it's just look at those four pieces of equipment and you can figure it out. Um, Number one, blower package. In reality, only 1% of the problems you ever have with your pneumatic conveying system is gonna be related to the blower. Um, today's blower packages are so reliable. I, I love this statement right here. If they run for a week, they'll run for 20 years. Uh, and there's a lot of truth to that because uh, of all the phone calls we get, never ever is it a blower. Um, Belts will glaze over, belts will break, but the speeds that the blower runs at should never change. Once it's been set up and once it's been running, never ever change it. Uh, and pressure relief valves or vacuum release valves should never be opening. So that blower sitting out there should, A, you should never have to change the speed, and B, the, the relief valve that's on it should never have opened. It should be almost rusted shut. Um, they do have one great diagnostic tool on them though, and that is the gauge. The pressure or vacuum gauge that is on a blower package does tell you what's going on in the system and it's the best place to start looking uh, when you're starting to think, okay, I'm gonna troubleshoot, where's going on? That gauge that sits on a blower will tell you a lot about what's going on. Um, first thing is, if you see a pressure gauge on a blower that's bouncing, and that means that it's sitting there going up, falling down, going up, falling down. Um, that is a very good indication that you're starting to see some rotary valve wear. Um, and, and I'll explain the rotary valve wear a little bit later, but it's, if that gauge is going up and down and up and down slowly, it'll usually start climbing, it'll climb and then it'll fall down. And it'll climb and climb and climb and fall down. Um, it indicates rotary valve wear. It could also indicate controls. Um, sometimes electrical controls will start kicking in uh, and cause this to happen. And, and you see it at the gauge crawling up and then falling down. Well, when I say it's a possible controls interaction, 
what that means is you may have a control system that's sensing high pressure, shutting off a feed device, letting it correct, and then taking off again. So, so be aware that it could be a controls issue. Um, if the gauge is sitting steady, but higher than normal, um, this is usually an indication of convey line buildup, hardening of the arteries, um, or the bulk density of the material has changed, gone up. Pneumatic conveying systems are sized for so many pounds per hour. Nowhere in the equation of sizing a system does bulk density come into play. So when you have, all of a sudden you're conveying 40 pounds per cubic foot material and it goes up to 45 pounds per cubic foot, uh, the system may not like that. And it actually is trying to get back to the original rate it was doing, so you're gonna see gauge pressure start to climb up. Um, if you're doing something as simple as plastic pellets, you'll probably never see this, but if you're dealing with other chemicals, you could see a change in bulk density, which would cause the pneumatic conveying system to run at higher pressures or lower pressures than normal. Uh, and then gauge is lower than normal. Um, that's when you start to see the system starving for product, uh, or you start to see bridging above your feed source. So um, a lot of customers nowadays of ours love to put transmitters on the blower packages and trend that data. I love it because it tells you a lot over time as to what's going on in the health of the system. Same truth for a vacuum. The exactly the same. Exactly the same. Um, convey lines. Uh, I say that of the problems out there, about five percent of the problems we see uh, are related to the convey lines. And uh, biggest thing is elbows. Elbows are the only thing in a, in a pneumatic conveying system that wears out. You should never wear out a straight section of pipe, but you will will wear out an elbow once in a while. And it's the only place in a convey line where your line will blow apart. Um, when the pressure inside of a convey line is, is really pretty equal and, and gradually goes down as you go down the convey line, there's never enough pressure to actually blow a line apart. But what you will see is a constant pecking at the elbow by the material that causes that material, the elbow to push out. Um, we, we a lot of times get this complaint that our convey line blew apart. No, it didn't your elbow got pushed out at the end. So support your elbows uh, at the end, so resist that force and you'll be fine. Um, but uh, you do see that every once in a while where an elbow will get kicked out. Um, people add more convey line to a system and not know, you know, realize that you just changed how the system is gonna operate. Um, what I like to tell people to do is go out there every once in a while on your pneumatic convey lines and just grab the pipe. You can feel what's going on inside. Uh, a dilute phase system, you should barely be able to feel anything. If you're feeling a little rumbling, kind of like you've had uh, bad Mexican food and it's just <laughs> rumbling, um, that usually represents you're starting to have problems because a dilute phase system should be very consistent, very uniform, and, and if you start to feel that line starting to rumble and buck a little bit, it usually means you're starting to have problems. Um, diverter valves, I put them in here because they're part of the problem in convey lines, and I'll address that in just a second, but diverter valves are part of the convey line. Um, maybe it's not the best picture. If you look right in here, this is a common problem with vacuum lines and couplings. Um, that gasket is actually sucked in to the line. Um, it's amazing how many times we see this on vacuum systems where the couplings are put together without what's called a gasket protector. And this is what happens. The vacuum actually leaks in through there on the couplings. The pipes will pull apart and, and, and expand as heat, as temperature, and, and so like that. So you'll get a gap between the pipe. And on a vacuum system, you'll start to suck these gaskets in. And what happens is the gasket gets sucked in a little bit, the material wears a hole in it, and then you start to develop a vacuum leak right there. And you cannot find vacuum leaks walking down a line very easy. So um, couplings are an issue when you pull uh, the gaskets inside of them. Um, this is another problem you'll see is hardening of the arteries. Um, I talked earlier about the gauge pressure gradually going up on a blower. Um, this is an indication. Basically your line size is just shrinking, gradually getting smaller every day. Um, so if you start to see a constant climb of vacuum or pressure, this could be a problem that's built up in the lines. Poles and elbows. Um, Number one, this is where you'll wear out any pneumatic conveying system is at the elbow. And uh, 
In a pressure system, it's real obvious. You'll start getting phone calls by somebody, whether it's a neighbor or uh, a part of the plant that's all of a sudden getting showered with material. Um, people will tell you on a vacuum system that's not possible and that's not true. You will actually see material leaking out of a vacuum line. Um, it's a little bit less because it's material that's, that leaks out due to momentum. Is it going around an elbow? There's only so much that uh, momentum will carry it through the hole. Um, but when you wear a hole in a vacuum line like this, you'll really start to see the performance drop off. Um, I love to talk about pneumatic conveying systems and how they're supposed to sit in the background and just run, and you shouldn't even know about it. It, it doesn't, there's no sex and sizzle to a pneumatic conveying system. Uh, they're just supposed to work. Um, and what happens if you develop a little hole like this? A, you got a mess, and B, the performance will start falling. Um, but uh, uh, this is the only place, if you're suspecting any kind of leakage, is on elbows. And, and you'll see just like this a little gap in the back. Um, a couple of little rules about pneumatic conveying lines never convey up at a 45 degree angle. Um, Horizontal, this is always kind of amazing too. People don't understand that conveying up is easier than conveying sideways. Um, so anytime you can add line to you know, horizontal pipe, it's better than, than a vertical pipe. Um, diverter valves, this is a biggie. If you have a diverter valve like what's shown here in the bottom, it's called a flapper style diverter. Um, it is a casting like you see here, and the casting has a flapper valve inside of it. Well, that flapper valve doesn't last forever. Now, you at the plant cannot tell when that flapper is leaking. But what's happening is, is you're trying to convey down line A, there's a certain amount of material that's going down line B, and there's a certain amount of air that's going down that line too. And if you're not diverting back and forth enough, you'll end up with a plugged line down the one that's not being used. But these kind of diverter valves right here are notorious for having that internal leak and you as walking down the pipe trying to figure out what's going on, you can't see inside of there. So there's no way you can actually tell that uh, you've got a certain amount of product leaking down one side or the other. The best way to tell is what I call corporate memory, which is you start to notice you're having a problem. When you go to divert down this line, you, you have a problem. It takes a while to blow the line clean or something's going on, but every time you're running down the other line, you're fine. These kind of diverters are notorious for having that leakage. Now, you have this kind of diverter valve, which is called a, a slide diverter, a hose diverter, or a parallel tunnel diverter. You can't have this problem. It'll never, ever happen. So just, uh, if you have this kind of diverter valve, you don't even look there. It's just not happening. Uh, there's no way for product to go down the empty line. Uh, if you had a choice someday to replace one of the flapper style, I highly recommend going to one of these kind of valves, um, just because never have the issue. Um, filter receivers and bin vents. Again, 5% of the problems in the field. And I've never even added it up now. I don't know what percentage we're at, but we're at a pretty low percentage. Um, filter receivers and bin vents for pneumatic conveying systems, they're not dust collectors. Um, so sometimes plants that have big dust collectors uh, kind of try to take that same mentality to the, to the filter receivers and bin vents, and it doesn't work that way. The, the, Bin vents and filter receivers in pneumatic conveying systems really defy all the rules of dust collection, uh, so the rules don't apply. And people will open up a filter, look and say, I've got dirty bags. The reality is, dirty bags are a good thing. Uh, the, the least efficient a filter will ever be is the day you put the new filters in. After that, they just get better and better. But uh, you do have one piece of equipment on a filter or a bin vent that you can use for diagnosing problems, and that is this, this timer board that's in every single one of them. Um, that is what we call a smart timer. It's got a four to 20 transmitter on it that gives you a pressure reading. Uh, it also allows you to digitally uh, do set points for on-demand cleaning and some things like that. But it's the only method of feedback you get on that filter, and what it does is it measures the differential pressure across the clean air plenum and the dirty side. It's just strictly a measurement of how dirty your bags are. Um, a timer board on a filter receiver has these functions. It controls the duration and the delay of the cleaning pulses. It displays the pressure across the bags. 
Um, the newer ones can be set for on-demand cleaning, which means they will not operate until the pressure reaches a certain point, and then it'll start cleaning. Um, you can also have contacts in them for alarms, and uh, the smarter ones have a 4 to 20 transmitter for, again, trending and monitoring uh, the data. Um, there's also, it controls these uh, solenoids and diaphragm valves. Um, electrical signal from the timer actually opens up uh, the back side of the diaphragm valve, which allows a pulse of air to go down the pipes and clean the bags. Here's what we see a lot of times, this, this whoosh of air. Um, tweakers is what I call them. It's the maintenance guys that go out and love to turn wrenches and turn dials and stuff like that. They get an attitude of you're trying to wash the bag clean with air, and the reality is, is you're trying to snap it. So think of it like trying to snap a rug. You actually want a pulse to go down that filter bag to sound like a, sh a rifle shot, not a whoosh of air. Um, and so a lot of times you'll see that you're getting that whoosh of air, and the whoosh of air will not clean a filter bag. So make sure it's a good crisp pulse and that they're all working. Um, holes in bags happens and uh, they're very hard to diagnose again because it's, it's a problem that happens inside of the filter and you can't see it. Uh, usually an inline filter downstream will start to plug up or something like that. You'll always see holes in bags in two places. One is along the wires of the cages because every time you snap the bag clean, it comes back and rubs against the wires eventually you'll wear a hole in the bag there and they're so hard to see, they're hard to find and they'll always be on the farthest one from the door. Uh, that's just Murphy. Um, or on the bottoms of the bags. Now when you get filter bags inside of filters and bin vents that have holes in the bottom, that's a whole different problem. That's actually a velocity problem inside of the filters and uh, a lot of times it's the cyclonic action of the dust inside that actually abrades the bottom of the bags. Um, Jumping down to the very bottom one, think of filters, pneumatic receivers, separations by gravity, not by the filter bag itself. The, the dust cloud inside of a filter should fall by gravity uh, and not by the, the physical uh, osmosis of trying to shove air through the bag. It's actually the gravity. So if your velocities are too high inside of your filter, the dust will rise to the top. You'll never clean them. And if the velocity is too high, a lot of times you'll see the cutting on the bottoms of bags. Um, the leaks on doors, these are, these are the ones that are tough to diagnose. Pressure systems, they're easier, you have a pile of dirt out there. Vacuum systems are the other one that's, you'll actually, if you have a leak on a door of a filter, on a vacuum system, stick your ear up next to it, you, you won't be able to hear it. And that's the problem is that You'll have air leaking in there, which is not coming down your vacuum line, so you'll see a, a decrease in performance. Um, we see this a lot of times when guys go out and change bags, they close the door, they mess up the gaskets, and uh, when they put it back together, and also they turn the system back on, and it's not working like it used to. Um, it's because usually you got a, a, filter, a leak at the filter door. Um, rotary valves, these are the rest of the problems out there and they're the biggest problems. Um, rotary valves um, are an incredibly high precision device and they're put in a really, really crappy application almost all the time. So people walk out there and they look at rotary valves and they look at them like tanks and they say, my God, this is a giant casting, it's a club. And the reality is, is that they're a very precise device. <laughs> They leave our factory at four to six thousandths of an inch clearance inside of them. And we're talking about valves that we build that go up to 30 inches in diameter, 10 cubic foot per evolution. We still maintain those types of tolerances inside of them. Um, and at 15 thousandths of an inch, we consider them wore out. Um, wear is also very, very slow and nothing you can see from the outside. Um, and once they're installed underneath the silo or, or in process, there is absolutely no way to get in to measure the tolerances if you wanted to. And not only is it hard to measure because it's just in the location, the wear inside of a rotary valve is never uniform. It, it finds a weak spot and, uh, and compromises that spot. So this last statement's a complete business in itself. 
there's our factory right there. I mean, rotary valve replacement. Uh, there's companies out there that sell nothing but rotary valves. Um, it's a quarter of our business at Magnum Systems is just replacing wore out rotary valves. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a big, big business, and it's because of that. Four to six thousand is when it leaves, and we're out at 15. Well, what is we're in ours? Is it maintenance, or is it the body itself? Both. Yes, that's the right answer, yes. Um, and you want me to put like Teflon wiper on the base? Hang on a second. Um, rotary valve wear is the hardest thing to diagnose. It really, um, there's nothing you can do to a, a rotary valve to be able to measure or predict how it's going to wear out, when it's going to wear out, uh, where it's going to wear out. It's always wearing out on the inside. And I love the statement, where is the wear? Because uh, you can get a valve. There's a picture of a, of a rotary valve. If you'll notice on the left side of this valve, it's as good as the day it left our factory. On the right side of the valve, you can see, I mean, we've got huge amounts of gouges and, and uh, wear on that thing. If you were to try to stick a feeler gauge in the top side of that valve, if you made the mistake of going to the left side, you'd say this valve's in perfect shape. If you went to the right side, you'd say, oh, nailed it, it's wore out. Also from the bottom, you can do the same thing and find out. You just, you can't ever figure out how, much, how bad it is until you take it apart. There's another great example, that one is on Portland cement. On the left side of the valve, you can still see the machine marks. On the right side, completely destroyed. Um, so when that thing is sitting underneath a silo, there's just no way you can predict uh, uh, or get in and measure it or see it. If you pull the end plate off, um, you might be able to see some of it, but the wear may have been completely on the other side. So I, as a manufacturer of rotary valve, all I can do is apologize. I'm sorry, it happens. And, uh, there's nothing we can do about it. Um, Such as a concentricity issue? What happens in a rotary valve is, is, is kind of like a, a dam pulling back water. If you just compromise one little spot, the water starts going through it and it starts eroding that and it gets worse and worse and worse and, it, and that's what happens in a rotary valve. Once one little spot starts, then you end up with this. Um, the valves, when they leave our factory, at least they're checked side to side, front to back, and everything to make sure they're within the spec. But it just takes one little pinhole spot for it to start, and then it just cascades from there. And is it the product wearing, or is it touch off between the product. tips? Our rotor vanes never touch the housing. Nobody's does, or else they would just they would lock up. Um, a couple other things that happen inside of rotor valves besides wear is build up. Um, the valve on the left is, is actually a soda ash and it's just glazing and so what happens is this valve when it starts to run will start to howl and scream. Uh, anybody in here conveying sugar has, has heard this thing before where uh, sugar tends to smear and the blades tend to catch and, it's, it's, and lock up. Uh, or again this, this, the other picture is build up of stuff in the pockets. You can't see it from the outside all you see is a decrease in capacity. And so what's happening, you know, until you tear that valve apart, you can't tell um, what's going on. Do um, these ever run at high temperatures that would cause rotor growth that would make you touch off? The, the question is, is high temperature rotary valves and in the change in temperature, does it cause the valve to swell and lock up? Um, our answer to that is, is that we ask what temperature you think it's going to be at, and we'll actually machine the valve so that when it does get to temperature, it will grow uh, to the right tolerances. Um, we very, very seldom ever see metal to metal failures of the rotary valve. It's, it's usually the wear um, or the glazing like this, but metal to metal is just very, very uncommon. So, um, I do say, what, what do you see with rotary valve wear? Again, what you see with rotary valve wear isn't at the valve itself. You see it elsewhere in the system. And that is the rate starts to drop off. And this is usually the number one um, complaint is we were getting 10,000 pounds an hour, now we're getting eight, now we're getting seven, what's going on? Um, a very good culprit is my rotary valve is wore out. So when a rotary valve wears out, 
you start getting more blow by air. The blow by air is going up into your silo. When it's going up in your silo, it isn't going down the line. Uh, and it's also causing the product to be more fluidized so your pocket fill starts to drop off. Um, this frequency of line plugging going up is, is a great indication that you've got a rotary valve wearing out. Um, and it goes back to the blower pack package. If that gauge is starting to bounce, usually a good indication that you're starting to see rotary valve wear. Um, corporate memory is probably one of the best tools to troubleshoot rotary valve wear. And what happens with what I call corporate memory is um, it's January 1st and the line plugs. And so everybody runs out there and, and they bang on the pipes and they maybe disconnect lines and whatever they do, they get the thing running again. And it works great and everybody forgets about it. Uh, and then in July it happens again. We plug up the line, maintenance gets it going, whatever. And then August, September it happens again and then pretty soon it's happening every week and then pretty soon it's happening on a daily basis. And people forget when they're doing that, they're like, well this problem's just started happening. You know, we're just plugging the line every day now. No, the problem happened clear back in January. We just didn't realize that the problem is starting to increase its frequency. Um, and, and that's a real good, if you can have somebody that puts it together, they start to see, hey wait, we're starting to plug more and more often rotary valve wear. Um, and again, it's both with pressure and vacuum because a pressure system has a rotary valve at the beginning, the airlock at the beginning of the system. On a vacuum system, it's got one at the end and the problem is exactly the same. When the valve wears out, the leakage goes up and, and the frequency of the plugs start to increase. Um, so it, it's not just a pressure system issue. Um, summary of dilute phase troubleshooting is there's only four pieces and uh, I can promise you that you'll solve most of the problems when you start looking at the rotary valve and trying to figure out what's going on around it and do we have wear, do we have buildup, what, what's going on. And again, the frequency of these problems tells you a lot about what's going on. Dense phase conveying, um, different animal, but um, it has the same four pieces slightly modified. Every dense phase system has an air compressor. And the air compressors fall into two categories. Um, one is a dedicated compressor for the dense phase system or an air compressor that's part of a plant system. And uh, the, you gotta handle them just a little bit different. You have a convey line, just like in a dilute phase system. You have a filter receiver, just like a dilute phase system. Uh, and in this case, you have what's called a pressure vessel, a code vessel that's the beginning of the system, uh, kind of like the airlock. Um, if you look at each piece, first of all, starting with the air compressor, um, air compressors generate a mist of oil, and oil filters have to be changed. Um, and this is one of those things that gets missed a lot of times as people forget, and they plug up, and your air volume that's going through your compressor really starts to fall off. Um, Air compressors generate a lot of water. Um, a lot of our dense phase problems we see is actually related to this problem right here where we have a failure in the air dryer and you start getting a lot of water that's going down the line. The water gets into the valves, gets into the product, uh, and uh, you've got quite a mess going on there. So from an air compressor standpoint, you've got the oil separator and you've got the water separator, uh, two things to look for, and then the accumulator. Um, Accumulators are very much required for dense phase systems to work right. Um, a dense phase system, the airflow that it uses is going up and down all the time. The accumulator helps spread that out. <laughs> if done right, the accumulator should pump all the way back up before the next cycle happens. Uh, if it's not getting pumped back up all the way, the next cycle takes it down a little farther and it'll just keep doing that until you're really running um, without enough air pressure. Um, so a pressure gauge on your accumulator uh, will definitely help tell you how much air you're using and if you're using too much. Um, convey line, the only difference between a dilute phase and a dense phase system is, is that dense phase systems are pipe uh, and not tubing. The couplings are a little bit different. Um, I talked about feeling what's going on inside of a convey line. Dense phase is, is real noticeable. 
Um, if you have a dense face conveying system, get used to feeling that line because you can really tell what's going on inside of it by just feeling the outside of that line. You'll feel the slugs and the rumbling and stuff going on and know it's normal. Um, if you have boosters in your convey line, um, that is something that uh, stir boosters are used to stir up the product right before it goes into an elbow or a diverter valve. Um, we ourselves at Magnum Systems don't use boosters in our systems, um, so I can't speak too much to them. Uh, other companies do have them. I can tell you that uh, the best place to put them is right in front of an elbow. Uh, just help stir up the product before it goes into it. Um, but this is a biggie on dense phase, uh, elbow support. If you look at that picture, those elbows are actually shoved up against that I-beam. Uh, and if you have a three inch dense phase system, you don't notice it so much. This is six inch, uh, eight inches are getting bigger, 12, stuff like that. Those slugs, as they come down a convey line, have a ton of mass to them and they have a ton of energy and they've got to turn all of a sudden the direction. Those things will bang and tear apart. If you don't have the elbow supported well enough coming back, you can tear the elbow off the line. Um, so dilute phase systems, supporting the elbow is very important. Dense phase, it's mandatory that you support it right um, because you will have all sorts of damage. Uh, diverter valves in dense phase systems. This is something that a lot of people don't think about, but a diverter valve in a dense phase system, when those slugs hit the diverter, if it's not a smooth transition, you get the same thing, which is the hammering of an elbow. You get the same thing on a diverter valve. You get a slug hitting it, it can't turn, and all that energy gets transferred into that diverter valve uh, and uh, can cause the pipes to pull apart and uh, slugs to stop moving. Better design as a hose type diverter, uh, if you can, because now I don't have that sharp angle where a slug has to turn. Um, what is the, the, the difference between dilute phase and dense phase conveying? Um, there are different modes of how the material flows through a line. Um, and it's the material that allows dense phase to work. And that's part of this dense phase troubleshooting is um, sometimes material, the material you're conveying has changed. Um, and so, the, uh, here's the big difference between dilute phase and dense phase. Uh, the top line is a dense phase line. And this is where I talk about if you can feel the line, you can actually feel those slugs going by. And this is the way a good dense phase system should work. Slugs nice and smooth going by one at a time. There's a dilute phase system. slugs hit an elbow or a diverter valve, that's when you'll, you'll that force that bangs into them. Um, the filter receiver or bend vent on a dense phase system is the exact same filter, same bend vent used in a dilute phase system with a big difference here is a dense phase filter receiver or bend vent, the airflow that's going through it has actually got three different airflows. It's got a zero airflow, meaning that nothing's going on. The vessel's recharging and it's getting ready to convey again. And then it's got a certain amount of air that's coming out of it while you're conveying. And then you got this thing right here, peak flow, called the blow down cycle. And that's when the vessel goes empty, you get this huge surge of air. Um, and so this is where the DP readings um, on a bin vent are a little bit harder to diagnose problems because the DP's changing all the time depending on what's going on in the system, whether it's not running or it's purging or whatever. And that's why I say alarm set points and stuff like that are real difficult to set on dense phase filter receivers because that airflow is changing all the time. Um, the vessel itself um, is the starting point of a, of a dense phase system. And you have two types of vessels out there, top discharge, bottom discharge. 
uh, and that is just simply where does the product come out of the vessel. Um, bottom discharge type vessels, um, one on the right, one on the left could be a top discharge type vessel. 10 to 13 cycles an hour is a normal cycle rate for a dense phase system. If you're running more frequently that or slower than that, there's room to start questioning is it running right. But uh, normally you talk about 10 to 13 times an hour is how fast you turn over. Um, the problem with, with dense phase conveying in our industry is that there's a lot of magic black box stuff around how the air is controlled on dense phase systems. Um, Magnum Systems has one philosophy, Company X has a different philosophy, uh, but they tend to fall into two categories. One is uh, keeping the CFM going into the vessel constant, and the other one is keeping the pressure that it runs at constant. Um, depending on what you have is kind of how you have to think through troubleshooting, but a normal dense phase cycle should look like this, where the blue line is the material filling into the vessel, it sits there for a few seconds as it trip the high level and says, okay, let's go. Your airflow turns on, and then as your air turns on and you start moving product down the line, your pressure comes up. In a good dense phase cycle, material gradually goes out of the vessel, your pressure and your airflow stay constant through the entire run. That, that's a good, normal transfer, and again, it'll turn around and do it again, and do it again, and then do it again. Um, dense phase systems are only used in two applications. You either have an incredibly abrasive material, sand, cement, aluminum, perlite, or you have a very friable material. Popcorn, glass spheres are great examples. But for the material to work well in dense phase, it has to be permeable, which means air can get through it, or fluidizable, meaning that it fluidizes the, uh, the product and just turns it to water, okay? Air always has to be moving down the convey line in order for this to work, for a dense phase system to work. It never ever is not doing that. It's always on, there's always air going through it, whether it's a fluidized material or whether it's permeable, air is always moving down the line. And that's why when you have a plugged line in a dense phase system, this is what happens. You got the same thing, material fills up, your air turns on, your, your airflow turns on, and then all of a sudden, no more material's flowing out. You got a plugged line, the pressure will stay up high and the airflow will drop to zero. When you walk out to a dense phase system that's plugged, if you hear air still going through the system, there's a chance it'll work itself loose, leave it alone for a little while. Um, but you, if there is no air, if it is dead, and there's no more air flowing into it, you have a plugged line, there's no more air getting down through it, you're taking the line apart. That's all there is to it. But air should always be moving down the line. Um, I mentioned, I'll stop here for a second. The two, the two types of vessels that are out there are top discharge and bottom discharge. Top discharge vessels are the convey line actually goes out the top of the vessel. The reason that we do this is if you have really fluidizable materials, talc's a great example, you put it into the vessel, if you had bottom discharge, it just washes down the line as you're trying to fill it. So if you do a top discharge, it's kind of like a manometer or a water level. It'll build its own level stop and then you convey it so we don't get this flushing down the line. On tip, top discharge vessels, there's a fluidization disc down here. These are notorious for getting holes in them. When they do get the hole in them, all the air goes up through them, you don't fluidize the material anymore and your, your top discharge vessel will quit working well. Um, Typically that material is like a buffalo weave fabric or something like that and most people that even have top discharge vessels don't even know that's there um, because it's not a spare part that you tend to buy off the shelf or anything like that. You have to buy it, cut it, and put it in. But if you have a top discharge vessel and you're having problems, look at that manifold at the bottom and uh, see if it's tore. So if you have a top discharge, how is it getting out of the vessel, the product, if not by gravity? This tube right here goes all the way down and sits just right above there and there's a fluidizing disc that fluidizes the material which turns and forces it right up through there. But it has to turn it to water in order for it to squirt out. Bottom discharges, however, are just strictly gravity flow. Plastic pellets, popcorn, stuff like that. 
just flows right out, so you don't have it. A lot of the times, these don't even have fluidizers uh, or anything inside. We just put a little compressed air to the top, and they and they work great. Um, if you have a dense phase system, I, I highly recommend doing this to it. Go out there and mark the gauges of where it's running and where it's running right, so that you can kind of keep your tweakers at bay. Um, and those are the guys that are going out there and constantly messing with all the valves and stuff. Go out there and uh, in this case we have the gauge marked as in the green of where it normally runs uh, when it's conveying right. And then the other one is where it falls down to when it's empty. So as the pressure falls back down as soon as it hits into that second set of green is when we turn the system off. But go out there and mark your gauges um, so you know later on coming back if they've been adjusted. Um, most dense phase problems fall into two camps. The materials changed, or like I mentioned earlier, the tweakers, the guys that love to go out there and change valves. When I say the material has changed, um, for, for dense phase to work right, the material has to be right. And uh, I mentioned earlier sand. Sand's a great material to run dense phase. We've got them running systems that have been 20 years and never wore a hole in a pipe. Um, if you tried to put beach sand, in that same vessel, it would plug every single time. And the reason for that is, is dense phase systems hate big particles and little particles mixed together. Um, so sometimes in a dense phase system, a process has gone haywire and you start to get fines mixed in with your, your good, nice round particles, and that'll start to cause plugging. So um, if everything's the same, nothing's changed, and you're all of a sudden having problems, you might wanna start looking at the material to see if its particle size and distribution has changed because that will cause dense phase systems to get uh, a little squirrely. Um, so, dense phase, uh, troubleshooting the loop phase. Any questions? Anybody got a problem? And I tried to do this at a 30,000 foot level and not dig into the weeds too much, but just simply give you that gas, spark, and air analogy to troubleshooting a, a pneumatic system. So um, we're upstairs in 211 if you want to come by and, and address anything or if you want to throw it out here to the group. I think we have plenty of time. I don't know what time it is. Yeah, 15 minutes until you pick us out of here. So anybody got a specific issue that I want to talk about or? Very general question. You, you talked about the speeds. What do you consider the practical maximum for that loop phase? conveying rate before you need to look at dense phase? For dense phase? For, for dense phase, you better be able to walk down the line faster than the material's running for a good dense phase system. Okay. Now, now that doesn't mean that people have, there are companies out there that don't have dense dilute phase or they only have dense phase. So sometimes they, in a rush to sell something, they misapply. And a lot of times if you have a dense phase system that was maybe sold when a dilute phase system would have been better is when you'll see they have to start cranking the velocities up. And, and that's that's that particle distribution thing where um, if you start to have plugging, you need boosters and things like that, a lot of times that means that you're really dilute phase. So we look at it and say you should be able to walk down the convey line faster than the slugs are moving. So I think that comes out to that thousand feet per minute is about where we start with our sizing. So, and then, so. Sir? Brad, um, in dense phase systems, there's really three types of valving that I think there are available for sealing vessel. Standard butterfly valves, and plate C, and sperry valves. Have mm -hmm. you had experience with those different types of valves? And yes. What would your comment be on that? Yeah. Um, my common feeling on it is, is that we use the double butterfly valves with a poison valve above that was a sacrificial one and then a sealing valve underneath uh, as a very inexpensive, replaceable way to go. Um, if you do the, the, the fancier dome valves and the inflating style valves, the biggest problem you run into there is it will wear out. And when it does, you're in trouble because you're talking 10 to 12 weeks before you get a new one and they're very, very expensive. So I'm a firm believer in uh, keep it simple uh, and get it to where the replacement part, you know, the butterfly valve, a 12 inch butterfly valve is probably, how many of them are within 
100 miles of us right now, you know, to replace versus a specialized valve. Um, I guess that answers my question, keep it simple. <laughs> the, the other valves work, don't get me wrong, and, and they work for a long time. I just am always afraid that they're more more flash and dance than they're what they're worth. So.